Good morning. Good morning, everyone. If I could ask you to please find a seat. We have a lot to do this morning, so I think we're going to try to get started on time. Happy New Year. Uh, I'm Karen Jacobs. I'm the director of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute here at Sonoma State, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the Ollie Winter Course Preview. As many of you know, and some of you are tired of hearing me say it, but for the benefit of those of you who are new to us, and in fact, we saw many new faces this morning, this is our 18th year at Sonoma State University. Uh, and when I thought about that this morning, I thought it was a timely moment to be of legal voting age. <laughs> so here we are at the age of 18, and there are now 122 Osher Lifelong Learning Institutes around the country, all located on college campuses, and we were the second to be established in that expansive network, so we're quite proud of that. We are already planning a number of celebrations for our 20th anniversary, so stay tuned, but uh, expect some, some uh, pomp and circumstance around that milestone. I always like to ask how many of you who are here today were with us in the beginning? Hands, I see many of you, wonderful veteran Ali students, and how many of you have been with us for 10 years or more? Wonderful. And uh, just as importantly, how many of you are here today with us for the first time? Oh my goodness. <clears throat> I have never seen that many hands when I've asked that question. That's fantastic. Welcome to all of you. Uh, new Ollie students, thank you for joining our family. I think you'll find that we are a curious, and I mean that in the good sense, and very congenial group, and I'm delighted to have so many new faces here today. One of the things that we know to be true is the only thing that stays the same is change. And it is in that spirit that I want to share a little bit of news with you today uh, about our OLLI program. Sonoma State will soon be renovating a building called Stevenson Hall, which is one of the oldest and largest classroom buildings on the campus. The university will consequently need to use the Cooperage Hall, which has been our home here on the campus, to house those classes of students who are displaced from the 29 classrooms in Stevenson Hall that will be out of commission during that time. So as a result, the entire School of Extended and International Education, uh, under which umbrella Ollie lives, will be relocating to Sonoma Mountain Village, effective in the fall. Now, I know you're going to have a lot of questions. Let me share a little bit of information here, and we can revisit this many times between now and the fall. Um, this is a temporary relocation while the university renovates Stevenson Hall and may be extended depending on how the university reconfigures its classrooms post-construction. But please understand this. Our program remains unchanged. It is simply moving a mile and a half down the road to a location with free parking. <laughs> That's all I get for that? <laughs> I'll repeat that for effect or in case anyone didn't hear me. Free parking. <coughs> there we go. And a built-in restaurant and bar. We will still have a substantial footprint here on the campus with our summer classes, our course previews, our offerings in the Wine Spectator Learning Center, and many other OLLI events. Your student benefits that you get with your SSU student ID card, which you can obtain as an OLLI student, will still be completely valid. So fear not about that. 
we will distribute a more detailed uh, FAQ sheet in every course this term with more information. And again, the change is not effective until the fall, so I wanted to let you know about it as a sort of heads up initially, and we will be reminding you about it over the next several months. So back to today's program and the present moment, each instructor will have five, and I'm going to repeat that for effect in case some of our faculty don't believe me, five minutes to present their upcoming course to this discerning audience. As many of you know, I have been known to tap people on the shoulder who have trouble counting to five, and I will try to be tactful, though I make no promises. So, you all have an agenda. Um, a we ran out, which is a lovely thing, because I think we have a, a terrific crowd today, but if you, if you don't have one, you can share with your neighbor and follow along. And without any further ado, let's get started. So, our first presentation today is from an instructor who is no stranger to Ollie. And though it has the word architecture in it, her background is in physics, and it is indeed a fascinating blend of art and science to my mind. And I welcome to the stage Sally Heath. Good morning. Yep, it's working. Thank you, Karen. I'm leading off this morning because I'm going to be leading off each week in our OLLI session with my class on Monday mornings. And I'm going to be talking about the science behind, inside, and under world famous architecture. Now, what science am I going to be talking about? Well, of course, there's going to be some basic physics. And there's going to be a lot about forces because when buildings are standing up, Everywhere in the building, the forces up, down, north, south, east, west have to all cancel out. So there'll be a lot on forces. Uh, I'll talk about engineering science or construction science. That is, how did they do that? And then some on material science because what can be constructed and how it can be constructed depends on the properties of the building materials available. So the first class, we'll be talking about Egyptian and Greek architecture. Mainly then it'll be about the Egyptian pyramids and quite a lot on uh, the pyramid of Khufu, the uh, Great Pyramid. Then the second half of the class will be on Greek architecture. This is where I'll talk about the science involved with columns, beams, and then talk about construction of Greek temples. Second class, huh, the slide didn't come out quite like it, it was supposed to here. The uh, yellow is supposed to be behind the architecture and the, the two also, but that's okay. Uh, so with building materials, the Romans made extensive use of fired bricks and concrete, which cultures before them had not done. And uh, here's just a little photo of a wall that shows that construction. And in terms of their architectural features, there are a lot of semicircular arches. There are vaults, I'm talking about entrances, passageways into theaters and coliseums and so on. And then, of course, uh, the Romans built domes, and the most famous of those is on the Pantheon, which was built 113 to 125 common uh, era. The diameter of the dome is 142 feet, and it remains the largest non-reinforced concrete dome in the world. It was not until the 20th century, well into the 20th century, that a reinforced concrete dome reached that diameter. Second class will be on Byzantine, Romanesque, Gothic basilicas and uh, cathedrals. I'll start out with Hagia Sophia in Istanbul. There I'll probably most uh, concentrate on the, the dome, but Hagia Sophia was completed 537, and it was the largest cathedral in the world for 900 years. And while we're on domes, I'm going to spend a little time on Brunelleschi's dome, although that's Gothic, so kind of at the end of the period I'll be talking about. And it was built 1420 to 1436, 143 feet in diameter. 
and it remains the largest brick and mortar dome in the world. Then we'll turn to the Romanesque. In Pisa, they have a marvelous set of Romanesque buildings, the baptistry, the cathedral, the bell tower, but of course, it's most famous for the bell tower. So we'll be looking at that also. And then uh, we turn to the Gothic period, and uh, flying buttresses are a big thing on Gothic churches, and if you sign up for the course and take it, you probably will hopefully leave knowing more about how flying buttresses work than 99.9% of the population. So you're going to get a lot on flying buttresses. Now, that class will occur on Monday, February 11th, and on Friday, February 15th at the Glazer Center, there's a course that I'm considering to be a partner course called Spirit in Stone, Architecture as Ritual Space, taught by Heidi Cretien. As the committee was selecting courses for this round of classes, they had Heidi's proposal and my proposal. They were concerned there'd be some duplication. They contacted us. We communicated with each other. No duplication expected. I'm going to be talking about stones and bricks and mortar, and that doesn't talk about the social and religious and aesthetic aspects. So uh, Heidi and I got together and uh, asked people to put it on that Friday after I finished talking about the uh, Gothic cathedrals because she will be talking about the Parthenon, the Pantheon, Gothic cathedrals, and one other class, I mean one other structure. So I would encourage those of you who enroll in my class to consider taking Heidi's class also and of course vice versa. Moving on, lesson four, class four, we'll be covering the 18th century through the 20th century in architecture. And basically what I'm looking at there are structures that involve iron, steel, Concrete, reinforced concrete, pre-stressed concrete. So this is the time for the iron, steel, and concrete. Two edifices I'll be talking about are the Eiffel Tower, which is built of iron. It was the entrance to a 1889 World's Fair, and then the Sydney Opera House, built later in the 1900s with precast concrete panels and ribs. Lesson five, class five will be on bridges. There are lots of kinds of bridges. Arch bridges, truss bridges, and this is when I'm going to be talking about the physics and stuff behind trusses. Uh, cantilever bridges, beam bridges, suspension bridges, we'll take time to talk about our own Golden Gate Bridge, cable stayed bridges. And finally then, to lesson six with skyscrapers. And some people would claim that skyscrapers would not exist except for Elisha Otis with his elevators, but more important than just the elevator was that he had an automatic elevated brake that he invented. So we'll be taking a look at elevators as well as other science dealing with the skyscrapers. So on Monday mornings, oh, I set this up on a, a, a Mac and they're doing it on a, a PC. So my S got out of place there, but anyway, uh, I invite you to join me on Monday mornings. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you also, Sally, for mentioning the Glazer Center. I just want to make sure that all of you know and invite you all to our second course preview this week on Friday at our other facility, which is indeed the Glazer Center in downtown Santa Rosa, where currently we're offering single lectures that are just one-time, two-hour events. And uh, that is what Sally was referencing. Heidi Cretien is one of four instructors who will be teaching there this term. And that is a separate preview with those four classes being profiled and more free food. So join us there on Friday morning. Our next presenter, unfortunately, could not be here in person today because he is in uh, high demand and is teaching in another county as we speak. But his presence will come across on video, I believe, um, in a way that those of you who do not yet know him will get a real flavor. He is a bit irreverent, um, I think brilliant. How many of you have taken a class with James Sokol? How many of you would take another class with James Sokol? Right, okay, so 
uh, via technology, but still uh, potently involved in the program, Mr. James Soko. Verdi, Bellini, Mozart, Sonoma. Oh, Sonoma! Oh my gosh, what time is it? Oh, okay. I gotta get up early to get up to Sonoma to start teaching my classes. But luckily, they don't start till January 29th, and not until 9.30. So let's all have a cup of coffee and come to opera class, because this year we have a great class waiting. It's called Journey Through the Ages. And in this class, We'll be looking at the six different periods of opera, starting with the Baroque, think about Handel, classical, think about Mozart, bel canto, or beautiful singing, the operas of Donizetti, Rossini, and Bellini. And then there's the classical period of Verdi, Wagner, and many more. And then the excitement of the Verismo period with Puccini, and finally, modern opera, 20th century, which ranges from the beautiful melodies of Strauss to Britain to what's going on today. During this class, we'll learn all about the different periods and how they differ one from another as voice, music, meaning the orchestra, and the words fight for dominance and the pendulum swings back and forth going from words to music, to voice, it's really interesting. The music from one period to another varies so greatly, you may find that you love it all, or you like one period more than another. Who knows, maybe you won't like any of it, but I don't think that's the case, because throughout there's just beautiful, beautiful music. So come join me for Exploring Opera, Journey Through the Ages at Ali Sonoma Estate. Hope to see you there until January 29th. Bye. Okay, so staying with our arts theme here, um, it gives me great pleasure to invite to the stage somebody who not only has taught for Ollie many times, but is also the founder of our cinema club, which has uh, grown in number since its inception last year. And she is a wonderful film historian. Uh, many classes, how many classes have you taught, Barbara? Double digits. 18, we'll go with 18. Given that it, 18 is a theme this morning, we'll go with 18. And uh, she is back to teach a new class for us that she's not taught before on Frank Capra and the American Dream, Barbara Spear. I'm a little short this week. Well, thank you, Karen, for your introduction, and thank you, students and friends, for your warm welcome. Uh, it's wonderful to be back at Ollie, and I'm looking forward to a new semester and a new course, Frank Capra and the American Dream. I'm so eager to begin the course, I actually put the wrong date that it starts on, the, on my title card here. It starts the 29th, not the 9th. Yes, we'll get that right. Well, we're all human, aren't we? Uh, of course, Capra is the director who was responsible for bringing to the movie screen some of our most beloved classic films. It Happened One Night, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, and most of all, It's a Wonderful Life. How many Christmases have we spent learning that each person's life is worthwhile, 
and every time a bell rings, an angel gets its wings. But why Capra, and why Capra right now? Well, the idea for this course was motivated by my concern about the status of immigration in this country today. Refugees from places where their lives are in danger, being denied entry to the US, children being separated from their parents. What's happened to the dream of immigrants for the chance to pursue a better life? Well, Frank Capra was born, Francesco Rosario Capra, in 1897 in a little village near Palermo, Sicily, in Italy, the youngest of seven children. In 1903, Capra's family emigrated to the US, and Frank, in fact, celebrated his sixth birthday on board that ship. As the ship brought them into the New York City Harbor, young Frank stood next on deck next to his father, who pointed to the Statue of Liberty and said, Chico, look, look at that. That's the greatest light since the light of the Star of Bethlehem. That's the light of freedom. Remember that, freedom. Well, when I was very little, my father, mother, sister, and I spent our vacation in New York City. I remember nothing from that trip except when we went to visit the Statue of Liberty. We climbed up that long winding staircase inside the statue and looked out the crown on Liberty's head. There were jewels, those jewels were really windows. And we saw the entire skyline of the city. My father helped me up to see it. But my most vivid memory of what is what happened after that. My father, who was six feet two and weighed 220 pounds or more, Dad walked down all those steps backwards, holding my two hands in his two hands so I would not be scared. Then, standing outside, my older sister helped me to read the plaque at the base with its unforgettable words by Emma Lazarus. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Well, no wonder this topic of immigration is especially close to my heart. In this course, we'll be viewing our country through the eyes of an immigrant. Capra, a man who believed in the American dream and who worked so hard to achieve it that little more than 30 years after he came to this country, between 1934 and 1938, he was awarded three Best Director Oscars within that four-year period. There he is with just one of them. Well, Capra not only believed in the American dream, he also translated that belief into his belief in the American people, his belief in the fundamental goodness of the ordinary American citizen, believed in their power as a moral good, morally good force against the establishment, against those who place their own interests above the interests of those they serve. So Capra believed in populism, in how it shows the American dream in action, and he put all this in his movies, especially in those films he made during the Great Depression of the 1930s, during that decade when national unemployment reached 23%, when people stood in bread lines to get food for their families. Capra had his finger on the pulse of the American public. Well, Capra's connection to the ordinary American people during the 1930s can be seen in his first big hit, it happened one night. Stars Claudette Colbert as a spoiled brat heiress who knows nothing about the real world. Clark Gable as the poor reporter who teaches her about life and love. It happened one night became the first film to win all five top Oscars. And the class differences on display in the movie clearly registered with both audiences and critics. Capra followed this success with a series of films that embellished his belief in the people of America. Mr. Deeds Goes to Town stars Gary Cooper as a man who inherits great wealth and has no use for it, so he tries to give it away to the poor. In Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, Capra examines the workings of our US Senate, exposing the corruption that's uncovered by the common man, James Stewart. Meet John Doe's story warns of how a millionaire's money could back a political movement that could get him elected president. Surely, that could not happen here. Well, it seems clear that Capra's films will resonate with us today, not just concerning immigration, but also in the way the middle class is disappearing, in the never-ending battle of the rich to hold onto their money and power, 
and in the manipulation of the media as a way of controlling the masses. We'll watch one of his films each week and also spend one week viewing some of his propaganda films that he made in the time he spent in the U.S. Army during World War II. This means class will run longer than usual, so we'll have plenty of time for some lively discussions. I think Capra's movies will give us a new way of looking at contemporary problems and maybe even offer us some hope. My hope is to see you in the Cooperage on Tuesday afternoons starting January 29th. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Barbara. So we have one more video presentation. I have to stop hiring people who are so popular. Um, but this is somebody else who is no stranger to Ollie, and many of you have probably taken a class from him. Eric Sinrod is a practicing attorney as well as an educator who teaches uh, at many sites around the Bay Area. And this course that he's put together is a really interesting model of um, presenting, as you'll hear, particular cases, having you hypothesize about how they may have turned out, and then sharing the verdict with you and dissecting it with you. So I give you, uh, via technology, Eric Sinrod, Ethical, Moral, and Legal Dilemmas. Good morning, Sonoma State Ollie. I'm Eric Sinrod. I'm sorry I couldn't be with you today in person, but duty calls, and I'm actually teaching elsewhere. But I am looking forward to seeing you on Wednesdays at 9.30 as we discuss ethical, moral, and legal dilemmas. Let me explain the format. So basically, when we come to class, I'm going to give you a factual scenario. It could pertain to an ethical uh, conundrum, a legal problem, uh, a moral dilemma, and I'm going to give you the facts, and then I'm going to give you a handful of potential solutions or outcomes that you get to vote on. You get to basically vote on what you think is the best choice to how to resolve the problem. I'll then tally the votes, and we're going to have a curated, very civil discussion in terms of our thoughts on how to resolve the problem. Sometimes people's minds get changed. Uh, this format has worked very well at other places like the Fromm and where I teach at the graduate school and undergraduate level at the university. So let me give you just a super brief uh, uh, case study, if you will. We all know that there have been way too many mass shootings here in the United States. The Second Amendment of our U.S. Constitution reads as follows. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, semicolon, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So says the Second Amendment. Well, we're having all these mass shootings. We have the Second Amendment. What are we going to do about the problem? One option you could vote on would be nothing. Another, provide funding for mental health services for people at risk of gun violence. Another choice could be Congress should ban certain types of guns. Another option for you to vote on would be establishing rules blocking the NRA and other gun interests from funding politicians. You also could vote on courts should interpret the Second Amendment narrowly. And finally, an option would be round up previously purchased guns. So I gave you a handful of choices. You could vote on what you think is the best option, tally the votes, then we discuss. Usually, in each class, we go through two problems in depth. Now, like I said, this course has worked out well before, and if you behave, you'll even get a few lawyer jokes sprinkled in along the way. This is my third, I believe, Sonoma State Ali course, and we've done that in the past. What do lawyers use for birth control? Their personalities. Drum roll, please. Okay, listen. Run, don't walk. Please sign up for my course. I'm looking forward to seeing you as we solve the world's greatest problems. Cheers.
like to hire people with a sense of humor. Okay, moving on, I'd like to introduce somebody who is currently on the faculty at Sonoma State, a member of the OLLI Advisory Board, uh, has really helped us connect with the rest of the university, for which I'm very grateful. He's taught a number of classes for our program, and he returns today with the art of the deal, literature, and the world of business. Please join me in welcoming Tim Wandling. Well, I'm so uh, excited to be here this morning to see so many people here, delighted to be back teaching with Ollie for the first time in a couple of semesters. Uh, my course is on literature uh, and really satire, and what I want to focus on in this course is the workplace as a place where meaning is generated, where so many people uh, who are in interested in writing literature, interested in the imagination, starting with the romantic period, are saying the last thing that you want to do is be confined by your job, to have what you do as your living be how you are seen as a person. We are all so much more than that, aren't we? Right, that's what the romantics tell us beginning in the 19th century. And we're going to take through, like some of the other courses you will hear in this course, the definition of romanticism and the romantic period. We will look at Herman Melville's classic story, Bartleby the Scrivener. Uh, I know that uh, reading is not required in this course, but since this is a course that's about literature, I would strongly uh, invite you to read Bartleby the Scrivener if you want to. Uh, I'll show you how I teach. I'm going to demonstrate a little bit. I like to use a lot of film and song, especially film. I use voice clips uh, of the pieces being read. So you don't have to do the reading. Uh, the course will focus on the meaning of the works, specifically around this type of workplace and satire. Now, how many of you have seen the movie Office Space? Not that many. That surprises me. All right, I'm going to show you a clip from that if this works. This is the character Tom, he's a minor character in the film, who's being interviewed by some efficiency experts, the Bobs, in order to see whether or not he's going to get to keep his job. This is the furthest thing from a romantic ideal. Okay. If you take the specifications from the customers and you bring them down to the software engineers. Yes, y yes, uh, that's, that's right. Well then I just have to ask, why couldn't the customers just take them directly to the, to the software people, huh? Well, uh, I'll tell you why. Uh, because engineers are not good at dealing with customers. Uh -huh. So you physically take the specs from the customer? Well, no. My, my secretary does that. Or the facts. Uh -huh. So then you must physically bring them to the software people? Well, no. Yeah, I mean, sometimes. Uh, what What would you say you do here? Well, look, I already told you. I deal with the goddamn customers so the engineers don't have to. I have people skills. I am good at dealing with people. Can't you understand it? <laughs> what the hell is wrong with you people? <laughs> All right, so you guys get the humor there. You got people skills, right? But, you know, what would you say you do here, right? How does that define you? The, the characters in the stories that we'll be looking at uh, will all have the office as setting. Uh, we'll be looking at characters whose life is in some ways defined by the job that they do, despite the romantics' early 19th century claim that that should not be the case. How have we not met that, right? We have the cubicle as a symbol of modernity, right? This is the ultimate place of just inhumanity in some ways, of actually being literally cut off from the other human beings around you. Uh, Bartleby the Scrivener, and at the end of this PowerPoint, there is a link to uh, online text that you can read of these if you want, and we'll make those available on the course materials for this course as well. Uh, Bartleby, for me, is the original story about the very first cubicle. Not many people read it that way, but I, I think I'll convince you on it if you haven't read that story. Uh, the, the story ends, ah, Bartleby, ah, humanity. And what does that really mean? And what can we say about the narrator? One of the things that I'll do in this course is teach you a little bit about narrative technique of mo uh, modernism, postmodernism, and the romantics, to think about how they present the world through different kinds of narrators. 
right? Bartleby is told from the point of view of his boss. So it's a, it's a limited, omniscient, you know, he, he only knows what he knows. And he may be unreliable as a narrator. That, that period of literature is very interested in that. James Joyce's character, Leopold Bloom, who's one of my favorite characters, uh, many people see him as kind of a loser, kind of a character like Tom in that scene that we just saw interviewed. He's a salesman. He's trying to sell things. If you look at uh, a few quotes from the, from the text, you don't want to try to read Ulysses before my class. Anybody read that book in this, in this room? Uh, that's a whole class on itself. You know, sign up for that one. That would be a group of maybe five of you would take that class. But that's really one of the most delightful books you'll ever read. And I'll give you little clips from that, mostly focusing on himself, this famous character who's seen as an anti-hero, kind of like that character Tom, kind of a loser who's struggling to defend his job. But I find him to be, as the Irish minister says here, uh, a book about the heroism of daily life. It kind of connects a little bit to what Barbara was talking about in, in Cap Capra's movies, too, that there's something about the humanity of that person who we see as sort of demeaned by his life. Death of a Salesman, another classic text in this genre, right? It's not death of Willie Loman. It's death of a salesman who is his job, right? Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that. And then we'll finish with, I'm not going to do too much with the book uh, here of this one. This is uh <coughs> American Psycho. Any fans of that book in here? Uh, but I, I do want to say that my course has nothing to do with Donald Trump, uh, even though the title of the course is The Art of the Deal, which I didn't even realize was the name of his book until I did that. But in reviewing this text, uh, the character here, American Psycho character, uh, his favorite person is young Donnie Trump. He loves Donald Trump. So there's the links of the books that we'll discuss. You'll get introduced to at least three different literary fields and the narrative techniques of those fields, romanticism, modernism, and postmodernism, and a little bit with theater and also lots of film. And we'll do some sitcoms too, like The Office and, uh, and several others. So I hope you can join us on Wednesdays at 1 o'clock, and I look forward to seeing you there. Thank you, Tim. So now moving into the science realm, because we try to balance the arts, the sciences, world cultures, contemporary issues, and many other disciplines as we put together our roster. I'm very happy to introduce somebody who is new to Ollie, um, who came in and really impressed us with a proposal that I think is unique and um, her expertise, her background in terms of her pedigree, but also the way she approaches the subject, really um, stu it stuck out to us as something that we'd not offered before. So Sandra Barrett is um, joining us for the first time. She got a little bit lost this morning, not knowing which room to go to, and I'm glad I found her or you would have missed out on a terrific class, Awakening Your cell Cellular Intelligence, Sandra. I hope I don't get lost during the presentation. Good morning. Awakening Your Cellular Intelligence. Well, the other title which I use is called Romancing Yourselves. And what this program is really about, it brings together biology, the science of the body, body-mind medicine, and your personal experience. My goal is to help you embody the knowledge that our cells have to be able to use for your own healing. And I recommend a well-written book, Secrets of Your Cells, Discovering Your Body's Intelligence. Came out a couple, about five years ago. So what is the course all about? What is awakening about? It's about becoming aware, becoming, getting out of sleep about our bodies are just this dull, ignorant blob that we might not like because we've got wrinkles or it's not doing what we want it to do. But actually, our bodies are very intelligent. And what does intelligence mean? Basically, well, the neuroscientists will tell us that intelligence is about the ability to, to learn, make sense of what you're learning. And in reality, at a level of our body, intelligence is about the ability to detect information, make sense of it, and really understand 
how to solve any kind of problems. And we are an intelligent being of trillions, trillions of invisible entities. Oh, this was my first uh, photograph. What, how I teach is through lecture, through PowerPoint, through visuals. I'm a microscopist and photographer. So this is the first cell I photographed when I was at the faculty at UCSF. And what was amazing to me, I was trained as a biochemist, hardcore scientist, and I see this living white blood cell under the microscope, and it's able to recognize there's something dangerous in its environment. And I thought, what? How do cells know to be able to read signals that there's something of danger to its survival? And then it will embrace how to get rid of it. So my intention for the course is to be able to bring you into the universe of your cells, teaching the architecture, how we're built, how the cells take in information, and the two key things I wanted to give you a little takeaway what the class is about, the two key features of where is cellular intelligence. One, it's on the outside of the cell, the cell receptors, which are antenna that take in information of the information between cells, the information of what you're thinking and what you're feeling, how that gets tracked down into the molecular environment. And then from the outside antenna, there's a whole matrix inside the cell that probably none of us learned about in biology. When we learned biology, it was the soup inside the cell. Well, now we know there's what's called the cytoskeleton, microtubules, microfilaments, that's a matrix that regulates the decision maker of what the cell does. I'm excited about this part of the cell because this part of the cell is where we recognize that energy, music, sound, movement impacts what the cell does. And that includes ex changing the expression of our genes. So we have, oh, that, that's a <laughs> another slide forward. Just to give you an example of how I teach and some of the uh, antenna. Um, I'm thinking I have a, a pointer, but I don't. On the bottom of the slide, are what the cell, a cartoon version of what the cell receptors look like. And on the left-hand side of the top of the slide is actually a photomicrograph of adrenaline. So we'll get to learn about the molecular world we live in. Adrenaline is one of the stress hormones and dis we'll discover the intelligence of how the body-mind responds to stress, fear, danger, whether it's real or imagined, and how we can step out of that. What can we do for ourselves and our healing, our personal health, by being able to tune in to our cellular intelligence and wisdom? And this is DNA through the microscope. So we'll get to have both the art and science of how our bodies work. The course, I've got a description on my website, sandrabarrett.com, um, of every lesson to go through to see basically what I'm doing is building your knowledge of the biology of the science, weaving that together with how what we think and feel influences what's going on inside. And then to get into a, a personal exploration of what we can do to change some of the ways we might be thinking or making choices in our life to ensure better health if we can. Of course, now I've got a cold. What did I do to ensure my health? Not the right, none of the right things. So the intent is to make biology practical, to embody your own wisdom, and also the overlay in this is I bring a little bit of the metaphysical into this realm. So we get into realizing we're not just a physical, scientific, biological being. We're sacred being. One key take home, take home, whether you take the class with me or not, is our cells are always in the now. We've got spiritual teachers forever teaching us, be in the present moment. Well, that's the only way our cells live. 
So what's taking them out of the present moment is what's going on up here. Our thoughts, our caca in our mind, our worries. Uh, we'll learn how to be more at peace in, with ourselves and ourself. So take yourselves for a walk. That's one thing you can do. Uh, there are a lot of lessons that our cells have to teach us. I will always translate it. I'll try to translate it, not only from the science, but from the personal. Our cells are listening to everything we think, feel, do, choose. So I'm inviting you to join me on Thursday, starting January 31st, 9.30 in the morning. We'll have a lot of fun. Thanks. Thank you, Sandra. Okay, so in my pattern of poaching faculty from the Sonoma State faculty, which I like to do, especially those who have won awards for excellence in teaching and who have recently published books, um, I'm delighted to welcome a new member to the OLLI faculty, again in the sciences, who has a book that recently came out who has an even more clever subtitle than the one you see on your agenda, which I'll let him share with you. Uh, I explained to him, as I think some of his colleagues have, the difference in teaching undergraduates and teaching this group. Very different experience, and he's kind of excited to join the ranks of Ollie. So please join me in welcoming Steve Farmer. Right. So, um, so we, we start off with the, the, the title of what I'm talking about, uh, or my class is going to be uh, about. I decided to give it something a little bit uh, more descriptive, uh, string chemistry in the world around us. So um, where this all started, and you're going to be hearing about this if you take my class, um, I'm very proud to say that I'm a first generation college student. My uh, Mother uh, grew up on a farm. My father owned an appliance business. And I was able to go through and get my PhD and become a professor here at Sonoma State. So when I went through chemistry, I think I had a slightly different view of it than most people. Everything that I learned was brand new and fascinating to me. And as I went through getting my PhD, I, I kept learning these facts. And I would see them in books and um, and I would be shocked that I didn't know these things as a human being and as a citizen, that how did I not know this? And, and, and when, I, uh, when I realized that I didn't know them, I started asking other people, do, do you know this? And then I realized that actually most people don't know many of these really shocking things that I learned. And so really where this uh, came from was stories that I started telling in classes. So I think many of you uh, have been teachers and it's the eternal question of why are we learning this? And I actually started at UC Davis and uh, it's kind of a famous thing that uh, I taught a, a general chemistry course that met Monday, Wednesday, Friday at six. So you imagine it was kind of hard to get students to so show up at uh, Friday at six o'clock. So I started telling these stories. I took these things that I learned and put them into a story format and come to find out these stories were by far of all the things that I did, I got the best feedback that they said they absolutely loved the time that I would take out and make these connections. And so this is where it started is making these little snippets, finding uh, interesting factoids and turning them into stories. And that was probably, I've been teaching almost 20 years now. Um, I realized at some point I had quite a collection of these, about 100 or so. And I really made it a mission of mine to try to share these things that I, uh, I learned, that these I found are things that most people should know that they don't. And I'm so I um, made it a mission to try to share these with as many people as, as possible. So I started, as I said, inside of my class, and then I started doing talks at Rotary Clubs. And then I said, you know what, I'm going to uh, put this into a book format. So I finally went ahead and published it. And you can't see it here, uh, but the, the subtitle they were saying is it's the stories that your chemistry teacher wouldn't tell you. 
And the part of the reason why I said this is most of the things that I learned, I didn't learn as part of the chemistry courses that I was taking. These were things that I would read in uh, the back of books or would pop up on Yahoo and it would have a chemistry facet and I would click on it and then I would start investigating it and it would end up teaching me something that I absolutely thought was fascinating. So in my course, I'm going to try to group these stories together. They're going to be individual snippets. They're going to start with a question. And then that was one of the things I like to do is to, to have a defined question, a uh, piece of trivia, um, that something that was easy to remember, and then discuss it, go into it, and talk about the chemistry of it. So uh, with the book, um, so pretty much what I did is I took this book and turned it into a class. I promise, much less words, much more pictures inside of there. But I'm going to go through and we're going to run through. I, I think I was able to fit almost all 100 of this, the, the, the little snippets that I have. Um, I've tried to group these things together. Um, and we're going to talk about just about everything. You will be shocked that chemistry shows up almost everywhere in foods. Uh, we're going to talk about radiation. One of the things that I thought was most fascinating is that nuclear or reactors are actually natural. I'm going to show that to you. Uh, pharmaceuticals, how everything's made out of oil, uh, illicit drugs, it goes on and on. So I'm going to try to group these little these stories into sort of generalized uh, categories, but really it's going to be about the story. So with the stories themselves, I think that's the best selling. And if you read the uh, description of my course, um, they'll, they'll have several of them in there. And then uh, if you go online, you look at Amazon, uh, if you look that up, many more descriptions, but I wanted to give you guys a few of them as a, as a teaser here. Um, and with this, uh, when I was writing the book, my editor kept saying that they wanted me to make chemistry funny, which was actually kind of difficult to do. Uh, so what I did is I started making uh, cartoons. And so I promised that um, in my course, the, the chemistry factor of it is not going to be boring. We're gonna try to make it accessible and we're gonna try to make it fun. So with this, one of the things we're going to talk about, if you look to the left, that there's actually a connection between uh, nicotine and insecticides. That literally when you smoke a cigarette, you are smoking a, uh, a, a, a molecule that is ba uh, that in the most powerful insecticide is based off of it. And we're going to talk about that. Over there to the right, we're going to talk about graphene, which is a substance that's so strong. If you took a piece of graphene that was um, as thin as a piece of saran wrap, it would be able to suspend an elephant on a pencil. That's how strong it is. We're going to go in, we're going to talk about graphene, how is it discovered, why is it so strong. Here, um, and this is another one of my favorite stories, is um, where does helium come from? And most people don't know that the helium inside of balloons actually comes from radioactive decay. And that, uh, why is that and where does it come from? Most gases that we have, uh, say ni uh, nitrogen, so you, most people know about liquid nitrogen or liquid oxygen, comes from the atmosphere. The helium that's inside of balloons does not come from the atmosphere. It comes from somewhere else, and it actually comes from radioactive decay. Uh, one of the other ones, and this is one of my personal favorites, why do old books smell good? So I, uh, as one, uh, when I love walking into old bookstores. You get that warm kind of vanilla a smell. Well, where does that come from? There's chemistry behind it. We're going to talk about it. And more importantly, why do, uh, if you look, some uh, pieces of paper turn yellow and other ones don't? Um, I think I got a couple more. Well, we're going to talk about why bananas are radioactive. And in case you didn't know, uh, it's, uh, it's been known that uh, shipments of bananas actually set off the uh, radioactive uh, detectors at borders has actually happened. And we're going to find out that uh, you know, radioactivity is actually everywhere, and it's this really common notion that radioactivity is unnatural. No, actually, radioactivity is quite natural. It's everywhere. It's part of us, and we're going to describe that. And it didn't quite turn out so well, but uh, uh, kind of one of my favorite topics is that oil, uh, pretty much if something isn't made out of a plant, it's made out of oil, and I'm going to prove that to you. Um, and here, one of the things that uh, most people don't know is most ph pharmaceuticals. About 80% of pharmaceuticals are made from oil. And this was one, uh, I remember when I was at Davis, I would stump an entire classroom, a classroom uh, filled this big of, uh, of, of students. And I would say, you know, where does, where does aspirin come from? And students would not know. 
and that was part of the reason why I wanted to share this. But you see here uh, Xanax, ibuprofen, Ritalin, aspirin, acetaminophen, the things that all of those things, if you take it, it was originally from petroleum. And then why is that? And uh, how did that process come around? And then more importantly, what were what some of the, the uh, drugs that are not made by, uh, by, by petroleum? And we're going to find out that those are painkillers or one of the ones that are not made from petroleum. And in case you didn't know, um, this is another one of my favorite stories is that painkillers. So if you take uh, Oxycontin or Oxycodone, they actually come from opium poppies that, that over in – they don't grow them here, but in Turkey, they have huge fields of opium poppies that they grow. They isolate this molecule called thebane that they sell to the United States that they turn into um, they turn into uh, prescription painkillers. So you can imagine that that's going to be, uh, and we're definitely going to be talking about the um, uh, the opioid problem. Okay, so uh, I think that's a snippet. I uh, do hope you take my course, and I guess I should mention it is uh, going to be Thursday afternoons. Thank you so much. Thank you, Steve. We're delighted to have you with us. So at this point, I would like to introduce someone who has taught many classes for Ollie, has been away for a bit, and I'm delighted to see him again and welcome him back. Yes, it says William O'Connor on your agenda, but we fondly like to refer to him as the judge. Please join me in welcoming Bill O'Connor. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Karen. What a nice introduction. That's uh, generous of you. I was uh, impressed, uh, since I'm at the tail end of the uh, schedule this morning, with the kinds of courses that are now available to you in the OSHA program here. And uh, what Karen has done over the last five or six years, uh, when I first started, the courses w which were interesting and the teachers were very good, but they did not have the sophistication or the depth or the breadth that uh, the courses now, as reflected in today's schedule, uh, seem to have, at least to me. Uh, so I think that's a credit to her and to the other people that put the OSHA program together. So you're, you're very lucky to be taking the courses here I think we should be thankful to her and to all of the people that put the programs together. She said, I've been away for a while. Uh, I've been teaching at other places and also have had other activities. Uh, I started, I have a very fond uh, spot in my heart for this particular program at Sonoma State. I started my OSHA career here uh, over five years ago. And uh, so this is the mother church for me when I teach. In 1955, Chief Justice Earl Warren of the Supreme Court ordered that all of the oral arguments before the court at that time should be recorded. Prior to that time, we had no record of anything that took place in the Supreme Court except the simple stenographic record of the court reporter. Those tapes from uh, the recording sat in boxes in the basement of the Supreme Court for 40 years. When they were finally found and edited, into a special set of 25 tapes with commentary by Peter Irons, a uh, uh, law professor at the University of San Diego who digitized and ordered and commented on 25 of those tapes together with his law students. These tapes have, as many of you know, provided the basis for 
many of my classes here. But for those of you who are new, those tapes give you the opportunity to actually hear live the comments of the attorneys and the judges as if you were there in the courtroom at that time. These are tapes of the Warren Court's most influential period, and I would suggest that the Warren Court is probably the most influential of any Supreme Court in the history of this country in terms of the changes that they made in American law and culture. Now this semester's uh, course, based on those tapes, will have a little bit of a twist. All of us tend to think that the Supreme Court handles only the biggest cases that change the entire American legal landscape. Brown versus Board, Roe versus Wade, Citizens United, New York Times case, Freedom of the Press, cases along those lines that we consider to be blockbusters. But you know, the court takes cases from individual American citizens just like you and me. That one case pertains only to that one particular person. Hence the title of the course, The Supreme Court and the Individual. We'll, in addition to the tapes, be using live videos from that period so that you can see the faces of the actual people involved. We'll conduct some interviews, or you rather not conduct, we will see some interviews with the various lawyers and litigants in those cases. And we'll examine the opinions of the court that impact the following individuals a disabled child, a white man's right to go to college, the private sexual life of a gay couple, an Amish family's right to practice their religion with their son, and finally, a case involving only one individual However, this particular individual happened to be the President of the United States. We'll examine the claim of that individual to be above the law. And we'll take the Nixon case, United States versus Nixon, and you will learn why that case is so significant now in the context of a similar situation with a similar individual. Now, in my previous cases, uh, not cases, forgive me, in my previous classes, uh, many students have found it helpful to get a copy of the book that was produced by uh, Professor Irons. Most of you know it, but for those of you that are new, it's called May It Please the Court, you can get it uh, used on Amazon. You can get it used uh, at uh, Barnes and Noble and Alibris. I think you can pick them up uh, for about a couple of dollars. I'd recommend you buy it used and uh, not buy it with the CD. Now, this is not homework. This is not a reading assignment. God forbid that we should ask anybody in Ollie <laughs> to do a little work. But just to be on the safe side, this is not homework. What it is, is simply a transcript of what you're already going to be hearing in the actual uh, tapes. And some people, because these are old tapes and even though they've been digitized, hearing them in um, the um, cooperage occasionally is difficult. So for your convenience, uh, if you'd like to get a copy, I'd recommend it. Uh, you can follow the actual arguments of the Supreme Court in the text here. Um, I think that's it. I, I recognize a lot of you in the class. Uh, 
in the audience here, and I, I hope that you will consider coming to take the class. I did not remember the exact date. Karen, I think it's the 29th of January, is that right? Yeah. My class is on Monday. I think it's the first one of the, uh, the, s the session uh, over in the afternoon at the Cooperage, uh, 1.30. I hope you'll come by, and I'd like to see you again. I d what? <laughs> well, why didn't you tell me, for God's sakes? That the, that, the, that the information was on the damn sign to begin with. <laughs> the author, as I mentioned, is the same person, uh, uh, Professor Irons. Um, the, the technical or full title is May It Please the Court, edited by Peter Irons. Uh, looks like this in paperback version. Um, it's nice to see a lot of familiar faces after being away for a while. I hope to see you in my class, and thank you for taking the time this morning. Okay, thank you, Bill. Welcome back. So that brings us to our last speaker for today, one who I know enjoys making an entrance. Some of you apparently know him. Um, <laughs> have not seen him for a while. I couldn't find him in the front rows where I told all the instructors to sit. But I see he's making his way to the stage as we speak. Please join me in welcoming someone who is no stranger to Ollie, Bruce Elliott. Excellent. Is this on? This is on? Yeah. Ah. Excellent. Ah, I was so relieved to see the handheld mic. I thought, oh, no, do I have to stand there the whole time? My goodness. So, 500 years of the Great Divide. Uh, a little over a year ago was the, indeed the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, and it brought a lot of changes. Certainly religious changes. I've got an image here. You know, so they, the reformers versus the Catholic hierarchy. And um, the, thing, the thing about the Reformation is how deep it penetrated into society. A cultural movement, a, a similar time period, cultural movement that is much more in a certain way flashy was the Renaissance. And the thing about the Renaissance is so let's say halfway through the Renaissance in, in Italy, you went to a, a city oh, a little bit distant from, from Florence and asked someone, you know, a clearly educated person walking on the street, what they thought of the, this Renaissance movement. They probably would have no idea what you were talking about. In contrast, you think of Europe, the four, four corners of Europe, let's say Portugal, Scotland, Finland, Hungary, if you went to a remote village and stopped a peasant on the lane and asked, what do you think of this reformation that's going on? Not only would they know about it, but they probably would have an opinion about it. So it was something that just so much penetrated in, into, into the lives of people. And certainly there was a strong religious contrast. This here's the uh, sort of a version of the syllabus of the course. And the first couple of sessions relate specifically to the history, the, the, the sequence of events. The first one on the medieval world. What was it like? What was the starting point when Catholicism was Christendom? And then we go to the second, which was the, the break with Rome. And this is the one where really we'll be looking most at actual religious theological differences. And the thing about the Reformation is as a cultural movement, it just spread so wide in all areas of life. And really because at that time, at that, in the 16th century, at that time period, and, and for a long time afterwards, the most important component of life was religion. That's what mattered most to people. And it affected all people. 
And there were kind of waves that went out from it. So when we get to the, the third week, we'll be doing religion and government and seeing some of the correlations that you get in kind of, kind of this contrast, the cultural contrast. In Catholic countries, almost always monarchies. Protestant cultures, those are the ones that generate republics. That's that sort of, and, and why it is, how, it, how, it grew, how that grew out of some of the religious differences. Though it was entirely secular in that manifestation. And then when we get to the fourth week, it's economic life. Well, how people did their work, how people approached money and how it was used. And you get, you get the, those contrasts. With, with the fifth week, we go into culture, high culture, particularly art, and how there were artistic differences, and, and, and really kind of how the two, there were d directions. Because in a way, really what this, this divide, the great divide, there's this divergence that took place in Europe. And for centuries, that was the most critical difference between sort of, sort of societal approaches, was the Catholic, Protestant. And then in the last session, it will be on rhythms of life. So it's kind of like, how, how was it different? What, what was, how did they organize society? How did they structure their time? How did they raise their families? Things that were different in that way. And I'm doing a bit of talking in this, and I'll do so in the course, but also there'll be an awful lot of visuals because uh, as we sort of go through. So at the beginning, we've got this dramatic scene where Luther is facing the authorities of the Holy Roman Empire and the Catholic Church on trial. And he says, here I stand. I can do no one other when they insisted that he recant his criticisms of the church. Religion, government, monarchy, how for such a long time, kings were known as God's anointed. And authority came from the top down. You certainly saw that in the church. Pope ordaining a bishop, bishop ordaining a priest. And really, in many ways, what you have is bishops and archbishops ordaining kings. And really, that was the, the basis of their authority. When, when you have that expression, the divine right of kings, well, the sense was, well, God almost chose the monarchs. Therefore, anything, anything like a revolution would not just be political, it would also implicate going against the will of God. And as time developed, they refined monarchies. So you get to the royal absolutism of Louis XIV, and the French. And in contrast, just in the very structure, the sort of daily workings of Protestant churches, how did Catholic churches get their priests? A bishop sent them one. And that's who there was, their priest was. In contrast, in Protestant churches, there'd be sort of the vestry, the church board. And they would work out, they would interview and hire their ministers. If you can hire a minister, what else can you do? You can fire a minister. And in a way, you translate that into the political realm. And what, isn't that what an election is? You can hire someone. And then you can reflect and, and, and view how they operate. And then you have the option of ejecting them. So in a way, this, sort of mo this movement governs from the, uh, the bottom up. And Rousseau, they, probably the, I, I would say one of the two leading philosophs of the Enlightenment period, and certainly the one who had the most political influence with his book, Social Contract, he's from Geneva. He wasn't from Paris, he's from Geneva, from a long Protestant line. And Geneva was one of those republics, or long-term republic, popular sovereignty. The founding fathers in the, in the Constitutional Congress the 55 members of the Constitutional Congress, 54 of them were Protestants. And that wasn't coincidental. Religion and science, sometimes early scientists in the time of the scientific revolution had a little bit of difficulty with the Catholic Church. <laughs> it took a little while for the church to, 
to come around. But and in contrast, you get Isaac Newton. He gets knighted. He gets made, made head of the Royal Society, the Royal Academy. And, and I, but I want to sort of say, because it kind of looks like boom and boom. This is not going to be an exercise in Catholic bashing. Because really, there are two approaches. And it's not like there was one that was better or righter than the other. It's more that, it, they, it's more that they were different approaches that began in a religious realm and then had societal implications. Religion and economic life. I did a Google search, I was curious. I did an image search on Protestant work ethic. And guess what image came up first? <laughs> so, there's, there's a certain, certain, certain kind of sternness. And we'll be talking about Weber's thesis in a book written about a century ago. Max Weber, German uh, historian and sociologist, father of sociology, in fact. He writes that, that capitalism was an outgrowth, was, a, was a, a, really a kind of a byproduct of the Reformation, that the it connected with Protestantism. I mean, people had made money before, they had been wealthy before, but the way in which the Protestants went about that and then what they did with their wealth was so much different. So we'll be sort of talking about that contrast. This is this, uh, from the 16th century. We have a piece of artwork. Laboring in the Lord's Vineyard. And you can sort of see, here, here you have a, a Catholic clergy over here. You have Protestant reformers here. And in the vineyard, you've got a kind of divide. And you've got the Protestants laboring away diligently. And the Catholics over here, well, not so much. <laughs> you've got the Luther and his associates there with their, their instruments tilling the soil. And over here, you've got the churchman who's there with a flute. You've got the friar with his jug of wine. You've got the, the monk taking a nap. You've got a little picnic going on here with a cardinal and his courtesan. I mean, you don't exactly hear about the Catholic work ethic. Artistic contrast. Um, in the Baroque period, we'll be, we'll be looking through time at church, a little bit of church design. Here's a Baroque church. Um, a little on the grand side. Uh, when the Protestants took over churches like this, they stripped the altars and everything else. They would tap out the stained glass windows and replace it with plain glass. And you go to places like the Netherlands and England today, you'll see these cathedrals that all had stained glass windows and now have the clear glass. And when they got around to building their own churches, they were a little often on the spare side. <laughs> because after all, what mattered was not the appeal to the senses, but the word of God. And there were places, in fact, they would call them meeting houses, not even call them uh, churches often. And art. Artistic con the contrast, especially as you see in the Baroque period, at, at, at this time when you first started having the divergence go into culture, and the art of Caravaggio, the drama, the intensity of his work, Kiss of Judas, Rembrandt, similar time period, very different approach to biblical stories, biblical scenes that element of reflection and repentance that was strong for the Protestants. Rubens, who were the, kind of the two great Catholic Baroque, uh, Baroque painters, period, were Caravaggio and Rubens. And you see some, see, see some things here that you don't exactly see in Protestant art, <laughs> such as mythology, mythological scenes. This is Venus and Mars. Well, what are they doing here? In, in Christian society, what being depicted. And nudity? What's the expression? Rubenesque? I mean, it, it's, it's interesting that at the very time period when there was this artistic competition between the Protestants and the Catholics, this is exactly the time period when the Catholic art was the most 
voluptuous, full. I mean, Reuben went to town, I have to say. Protestant art. Art of the domestic. Art of daily life. You know, in Protestant art, even when it's religious art, like Rembrandt, how many times do you see angels and putti flying about the canvas? Baroque, it's, with, with Rubens, they're, they're full of them. And new art forms needed to be developed. Seeing as they, Protestant artists were really advised and, and, and almost forbidden to do religious scenes, they would do, invited, in, invented whole new areas of art. The still life, landscape painting. There have been landscapes before, but never was that the entire painting. Rhythms of life. So this is our last session on rhythms of life. And in a way, it's kind of a, a little bit of a counterpoint to what seems like this sort of criticism of Catholicism. And it's a Bruegel painting from the 16th century. And it's a fascinating, if you look closely at a painting like this, you can see that people, this is the carnival. The, the, most of the painting is devoted to people enjoying themselves, feasting, having, having so, uh, dancing together, playing music, lively. This, these were all parts of the, that, that community quality uh, that Catholicism fostered. In contrast, this, this corner, kind of this upper corner, this is the Lent side. And this is the ones that the Protestants were really good at. And so you have that, that contrast. So, so in, this, in, the, in the way in which rhythms of life change. Uh, on the Catholic religious calendar, there were 200 holy days in the year. That's kind of a lot. <laughs> For the Protestants, once a week, Sunday. So, some contrast. So we'll be meeting. Actually, we'll not be meeting at the Cooperage. I think Karen and the directors of this program decided with such an elegant subject, well, you ought to avail ourselves of the posh Wine Spectator Center across campus. So we'll be meeting on Friday mornings, and this is this intercession time. So it'll be in March. So I encourage you to take any and maybe even all of the courses you've heard about today, but then in that open period, when as the flowers begin to bloom and the warm breezes blow, come and join me for the Great Divide. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bruce. It's a shame he's not more poetic. <laughs> I'd like to thank all of our presenters today and also to thank all of you for coming, for being a part of the Ali community at Sonoma State. And I'd like to close today with a quote that recently caught my eye from novelist Doris Lessing. She says, that, that is what learning is. You suddenly understand something you've understood your whole life, but in a new way. So I hope at Ollie we can begin to open your eyes and your minds and look forward to seeing you all in class. Thank you very much. <laughs>